I've been using microservices for more than four years now. And all this while, I've picked up some cool tricks I would like to share with you. Hey guys, it's me, your tech bud. And in this video, we'll go through some tips which will help you get started with microservices. Before we start, I have just hit the 100 subscriber mark. I know it's not that big a milestone, but it kind of means the world to me. All the love I've been receiving in the comments section and in person really helps me keep going. So thanks a ton, guys. All right, time to do microservices. Tip number one, start by understanding why you would want to adopt microservices in the first place. Hold on, don't leave the video yet. Just hear me out. Like any other tool, take the decision to go with microservices with a fixed set of objectives. Many go in with the blind belief that microservices will make their app more scalable automatically. That's not how it works most of the time. In fact, when done incorrectly, microservices is most likely to have the opposite effect. So why should you adopt microservices? Well, instead of adopting microservices to scale your platform, adopt microservices to scale your development process. Microservices achieves agility by breaking down a larger project into smaller applications, encouraging smaller, more independent teams. Smaller teams working on smaller projects is what makes your development process efficient. So the real benefit of adopting microservices is seen down the line when your project is in its rapid growth phase and you're adopting microservices today so that you're well prepared tomorrow. This is something you should definitely keep in mind. So tip number two, determining the right size for your services. This is by far the most difficult aspect to get right when it comes to microservices. How many services should you have? What logic should sit where? How micro should your services even be? Personally, I find the word microservices misleading. It's because it places a lot of emphasis on making your services as micro or as small as possible. This approach can have a lot of negative consequences. It's time to take an example now. Let's say we want to build a blogging site like Medium where users can view and post articles. Users can optionally purchase a subscription to view premium articles. We can model this app by using a user's microservice to store the user's profile and the plan the user's on and a billing microservice to integrate with a payment gateway like Stripe. We'll also have another microservice to manage all the posts, but we can ignore that for now. So how will a user subscribe to a premium plan? The request will be handled by the billing service, which will talk to the payment gateway to bill the user. Once that operation is successful, it will fire a request on the user service so that we can update the user's plan. It is super important to make sure that both the billing and user service are in sync with regards to a user's plan. Failure to do so will be problematic because either a paying customer will not be able to access premium content or an unsubscribed user will be able to view everything. We do not want that to happen. I know that the solution to this distributed transaction problem is easy. Simply keep the user's plan information with the billing service instead of the user service. This way the billing service would not have to talk to the user service, evading this problem entirely. But this isn't the point. The point is that having many small microservices talking to each other increases the chances of encountering situations like this. And honestly, not every problem is going to be as straightforward as the one we just saw. Before you know it, your microservices will end up becoming a distributed monolith. Microservice communication has always been a tricky thing to get right. And for this reason, I've made an entire video on how you can make your microservices communicate. You should definitely check it out if you want to understand this better. So here's another tip. Try to break down your microservices based on the queries you need, such that servicing a single request requires as little coordination between microservices as possible. This will help you avoid distributed transactions a little bit better. So if you feel that there are two microservices talking to each other a lot, consider merging them into one. Always remember, in your initial days, larger microservices are safer than smaller ones. Now I understand that in some cases, avoiding distributed transaction is just not possible. And that's why I'll be covering a potential cure to this in a couple of minutes. I have one more tip before we continue. Try to design your microservices as if each one is an independent SaaS offering. 
I really love this analogy because it kind of helps decouple your teams. Think about this. We can't ask a service like Google or Stripe to change its APIs for us. I think we should have the same attitude when it comes to our microservices. I am not saying that we need to stop all communication between our teams. No, that will not work. The API contract or the API design draft has to be thought of collectively and it has to be thought of carefully. But once that is done, our team should have complete flexibility on how they want to implement their microservice. All these suggestions do make your development practice more slow and tedious initially. But trust me, with time, your teams will develop the right mindset and the right processes to implement microservice-based architectures. Remember, microservices is a design pattern and not a framework. And no design pattern can be adopted successfully without first imbibing the right mindset. Next tip, use eventing as glue. Eventing is a great way to stitch your microservices together while keeping them fairly decoupled. Wait, I just used the word stitch and decouple in a single sentence. Oops. Eventing is a mechanism to synchronize different services. It achieves this by emitting events on one side, which services can subscribe to. Its semantics are pretty close to a pops-up system in that regard. The unique thing about eventing is that events can be generated by various sources, like database mutations, file storage operations, function invocations, or manually via an API. If you think about it, we can handle the cross-service transaction problem we spoke about in the blogging example by using eventing. We wanted to update the user's profile whenever she subscribes, right? So what if instead of talking to the user service directly, an event was created whenever the subscription was created successfully in Stripe? Technically speaking, Stripe does generate events for such activities and it can deliver it to us by means of a webhook. The user service can simply expose an endpoint for this event to update itself. And we can make things more robust by publishing a dead letter event in case the user service fails for some reason, which the billing service can consume to stop or cancel the subscription. All this makes your head spin, doesn't it? But wait till you hear this. In this entire process, the billing and the user service haven't directly communicated with each other even once. In fact, they probably don't even know about each other's existence. This is what we call decoupling. And this is the magic of event-driven architectures. I'll be making a video on this soon enough, so make sure you're subscribed. Here's my final tip for you guys. Consider using GraphQL as your API layer. We have touched upon this multiple times in the past, but I guess it's worth indulging one more time. You may have to hit multiple microservices to fulfill a single request at times. Joining data in databases with results from microservices is a very common pattern. While we can build all this logic ourselves, GraphQL solves this problem automatically. It was literally built for this. The best part is, you don't really need to rewrite your microservice to expose a GraphQL API. There are already tools like SpaceCloud out there which can create a GraphQL API for your database and microservice automatically and help you join these various sources without having to write a single line of code. GraphQL can act as a great data layer as well. Take the scenario where a billing service needs to enrich the subscription data it has in its database with some attributes of the user's profile. In this example, we'll have to join data in the database with the results we get from our user service. With the GraphQL powered data layer, the billing service can fire a single GraphQL query and let the GraphQL server join the data from the various sources and give back a consolidated response. This offloads a lot of burden from your microservices to the GraphQL server. I'll make a video on GraphQL's role in the context of microservices soon. Till then, I'll put a link to a guide in the description below. Well, that's it from my side. I wish you success in this journey of adopting microservices. At the end of the day, microservices are nothing more than simple HTTP servers which we're used to writing. All we need is a sprinkle of discipline to make sure we don't end up in a ditch. Feel free to reach out on Twitter and in the comments in case you need my help. Like and share if you found this video to be helpful. And remember, I am your tech bud on YouTube and hopefully in real life.